If you could please uh, please reflex it. Okay, please stand. Place your right hand over your heart. Pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Well, I got a little bit of out of order there, but in the, why don't we go ahead and roll call, Brett? Commissioner Brown, Shillette, here. Pickens, Smith, Velasquez, East, Chairman, Vice Chairman Fuller, present. Chairman Vieira, present. At this time, we do not have a quorum. Correct. And in light of the fact that we do not have a quorum, we're going to go ahead and continue with this meeting. It will just uh, preclude, preclude us from taking action on any of our action items unless we have another commissioner that does show up. So at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor John Metters uh, to the podium for the invocation. Thank you. Let's stand and pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can come before you today. We pray your blessing upon our city. We pray that you would keep the city safe, keep our law enforcement officials safe, Lord, protect us. Father, uh, guide this commission as they conduct the business. And, uh, Father, we just pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And since we've already done the pledge, we'll just go ahead and move on to our next item, which is uh, presentation leaps. Uh, Mr. Dorico. Thank you, Chairman Vieira. Commissioners, I, what I want to do is we're going to bring you up to speed on some uh, statistical information we have on our LEAPS program. You know, we're almost complete, almost have completed our second year uh, through that process and that contract. And I'll have Miguel Ruiz come up and give you some numbers from the station, and then I'll bring you up to date on some things that we're doing to enhance the program. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dorico. Uh, good morning, uh, Everyone, uh, I have two pages that we're going to go through as far as slides. I have a first quarter report which covers the months of January, February, and March. The statistics that we have so far are in the categories of priority calls, emergent calls, and deputy assistance. Uh, during those 90 plus days, we have uh, for priority calls, we responded to 42 priority calls and 60 emergent calls. Um, and then we had deputy assist. Again, deputy assist are. Um, when a deputy either requested assistance or there was a backup request over the radio and the airplane was relatively close to also keep an eye on the deputy or help assist the deputy for whatever the prior, uh, emergent call was if it was an assistance request. So that gave um, our field deputies a little added um, uh, security or knowledge knowing that maybe if a responding unit on the ground wasn't getting there quicker, at least the plane overhead had eyes and was able to maybe mitigate any sort of issues or help coordinate if that deputy or the suspect was a run from our deputy. So it added an extra bit, bit of security to our field deputies for those type of scenarios. Um, our results during that uh, uh, 90 days was uh, we had uh, 61 investigations. Um, and those investigations were primarily either through our um, uh, detectives or our narcotics detectives or even our OSS units. That's our gang units where maybe they were looking at a house, um, checking to see if there's certain type of cars or a certain type of activity that's going on at the house. That would lead them to believe that maybe it's narcotics activity or there's some sort of drug, uh, gang activity, and maybe they're monitoring a certain suspect. For example, maybe we know that uh, a certain suspect drives a red car and goes to a specific house to do whatever other illegal activity they do. They can monitor all that information, which uh, alleviates the need for uh, a ground deputy maybe two or three ground deputies to be set up in different um, containment points around the block, um, on a school ground or some other hidden area in the neighborhood. So one airplane was able to do all that to uh, lessen the amount of manpower necessary for those investigations. Um, detentions or fines, again, um, to clarify, that has to do with the fact that uh, um, the plane was flying around and maybe there was a suspect um, maybe like a 415, a disturbance call, or maybe a, an arm, a sus suspected armed robbery um, or some other priority call where the suspect had left the scene. The plane was instrumental in either locating that vehicle and or that suspect, and it was actually the person or vehicle in that call, 
but that call turned out not to be a crime, not to be an emergent call, or maybe we thought it was like a domestic violence call, which turned out to be maybe a, a verbal um, call between uh, a couple. So the initial caller thought it was a crime. Deputies responded. The airplane found the parties involved in that, detained them, helped the deputies detain them, but it turned out not to be a call, but we still consider that a fine. Um, uh, an assistance, uh, assist arrest, in other words, there was a call that went out, uh, an emergency call where maybe there was a containment in a house or um, there was a containment around a neighborhood, and the airplane responded and helped during that assist, and it, it later turned out that maybe a suspect was found in the backyard. So the instrument was, the plane was utilized in that capacity, and we had 40 of those incidents. And then direct arrest, we had four significant arrests where the de the plane itself was in the neighborhood, was in the location, located the suspect, directed deputies to the backyard or to a vehicle where the suspects were at, and an arrest was ultimately made. So we had four of those over 90 days. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah. Um, I think that what I'd, I'd really like to emphasize here is, is what we have going on right now is we've had issues, obviously, the last month and month or so with wind, and there's a lot of variables here that affect some of the issues we have with that aircraft flying. But the biggest thing that we're going through right now is we're going through a more user-friendly uh, mindset as it relates to the software update. So. What has been the biggest struggle for the desk personnel in operating the system is that if there's a glitch or some issue to reset, there's a whole procedural mechanism for doing that. And honestly, I, we're kind of using the mindset, if I can do it, I'm talking about Lee, because I'm computer illiterate, if I can do it, that means any deputy sheriff at the station could probably do it ten times better. So that's the mindset we're working with. So one of the vendors that provides, that developed the software and provided for the system is Spiral Tech, who's also a part of AeroView. So Archie Moore, who owns Spiral Tech, has been putting significant resources to this program on, to, on this update with the camera system, as well as the software and mechanism for monitoring it. The other thing they've done is they've put a secondary antenna up on top of their station because we actually run the system from an antenna that's based at the old sheriff station at Avenue J and 10th Street West. In fact, the whole uh, storage unit and everything is in the basement of that station. Um, and we were having an issue as you, as the plane took a path over towards the um, southeast of the valley towards Plant 42, there was a lot of uh, interference in that IFR system there. So what they've done is put a secondary antenna where they actually link it. So that has actually cleared that issue up. Again, as they work through this software process and making it um, more user-friendly, it should be a better access tool for the deputies. Also, was it last month, Miguel, we trained like 40 deputies in the system now. We're trying to get a, yeah, we're trying to get a significant number of deputies oriented to the system and the uses they can use for it, again, as well as for the detective units on their investigations. So um, as it develops, again, we're the... Uh, we're the um, test station for a process like this, um, and exclusively the how this system operates compared to other systems that are out there, whether it be manned or unmanned. This is completely different than anything else that exists, and so we're going to just keep improving it as we work through this process. Any questions? I do. Um, yeah, I appreciate the presentation. I think it's always good to, to uh, keep the public informed of you know how these uh, new technologies are being utilized. The two major concerns that I've heard voiced in the community uh, revolve around privacy and cost. Mm -hmm. um, privacy has been discussed many times uh, at this commission, and um, I believe that we've been satisfied that there are many controls and backups in place to uh, ensure that the information that's being gathered is used uh, appropriately. Correct. Uh, the other side of it would be whether it's cost effective. The question always comes up, you know, wouldn't it be better to take the money that's being used on this and to put more boots on the ground, so to speak, and I, from Deputy Reese's uh, presentation, if I understand correctly, that it actually does help to reduce personnel uh, requirements and makes it more effective um, in our law enforcement efforts. I don't know if you wanted to comment on either well, one of those issues. I can say as one of the things that we discuss is and, and as we collaborate together with the stationer and talk about it as a tool for the deputies to use, the biggest issue that has come up for us is just we want to make it as user-friendly as possible and, and then start 
developing with the deputies on the different uses they can use it for. And that's always something that grows out of this. The biggest thing is it, is a, it should be used as a resource management tool. First part is officer safety, community safety aspect of it. The second part of it from us from uh, you know a budget management perspective is anything we can utilize that we have that's already an existing resource to save funds, we absolutely want to do that. I would say compared to certain other services you could utilize out there, and mainly being helicopter type services, which is very expensive on an hourly rate, it's, it's significantly cheaper to use this system. And again, the coverages and the amount of hours that it flies when weather permits um, is significant. You, could, you can't fly a helicopter that many hours a day with that kind of turnaround for that cost. It's not going to happen. So um, from that aspect, it's really good. I think the thing is, is we, we need to be creative, too, on how we utilize that and, you know, even ascertaining responding resources like for the fire department to an accident. You know, the fire department historically, based on policy, rolls every piece of apparatus out of the station to any call they have for service. Well, this is a way you could impact that. Based on, obviously, if you see people out of cars standing around, it's an lightweight accident and no injuries, we don't need to respond all those kind of resources to that. That saves the taxpayers money, those type of issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. All right, thank you. Lee? Yes. Can you talk about the response times? I think that's one of the I'm most important glad parts. you brought that up, sir. It's always on top of it. Um, response times is a huge issue. If we look at the response time for that air unit, we can get an eye on an issue within seconds. And that's probably something we really should highlight. You know, as we travel through our community, even though, you know, we have a fairly easy, simple grid system in our streets, it still takes time to negotiate through traffic and signal lights and things as well as a response. Um, that camera can be on anywhere virtually within the city limits within seconds. And that's, you know, a huge tool for that. And, I, again, that is also for community safety aspect, suspect apprehension, as well as officer safety and resource management. Uh, thanks, Lee. And the response time is critical. But I also heard the same things that, that Tim heard, uh, you know, about cost effectiveness and privacy. But in the same conversation with these people, someone else brought up the fact that if it saves one life or stops one criminal, how much is, you know, a life worth? And so I think having that ability to uh, put an eye on it, as you say, right away is uh, something that, that this community well, can be proud of. I agree with that. I think, you know, it's that same rule, and the captain can, can uh, verify that. The old adage that, you know, any potential suspect has only committed one crime is pretty rare, okay, the first time they did anything. So anyone that we bring into custody is probably going to have a significant impact on how many potential victims are out in the community. So anything we can do to mitigate that, we should take those steps. Thank you much. We can move on to public business from the floor. Agendized items. Uh, citizens who would like to address the Criminal Justice Commission on any agendized item may do so when the item is being considered by the Commission. Please complete a speaker card. Identify the agenda item you'd like to discuss in limited to three minutes. And we do have two speaker cards. So at this time, uh, Mr. Ed Galindo. Gentlemen, Morning. since we don't have a quorum, it doesn't seem that we can really do anything on this. I'm here on this resolution that I, uh, I presented to the city council for a vote. And, of course, they didn't vote it and sent it to you. I would like to know what your position are on this particular resolution now. Well, they, That's a question. I understand yeah. that. And there will be a discussion that takes place. There will be no action that takes forward today. If the commissioners independently want to share their position, they're welcome to do so. Um, but that's where we stand at this time. Well, can we place this over and get uh, – well, do it when we do have a um, quorum and see if, if maybe I can convince some of the other people on this committee here to, to – Pass this resolution, yeah, who, who? or to get it back to the to the council. Actually, okay. Uh, if if uh, if you feel that there's no further resolution or no further 
situation where we can get this thing passed. Uh, maybe we can just forget about it now and wait till the first of the year till the new uh, AB60 passes and eliminates a lot of the problems that we're having. We do have a few months left. Uh, I, we have contacted both of the sheriff's departments and the sheriff's departments are in accordance with us and they're working with us and we're working with them on some, on some of the problems that we are having with the undocumented people and primarily what this is leading to. So if you want to put it over, I'd love to, like to have it over and discuss it again. If not, that's up to you. Can I, can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, on the agenda today is that discussion. I, I believe you're aware that we formed a subcommittee to yes. specifically look at your recommendation and, and even a little broader than that, but the existing laws and enforcement. And um, I'm prepared to talk about that when the agenda item comes up. So hopefully I'll give you a little bit of clarity. But unfortunately, because of the lack of the uh, attendance of, of two of the members of that subcommittee and the fact that we don't have a quorum, we won't be able to take action. So it will be at the discretion of the city council as to what they'd like to do with it. Well, before, we, before I do sit down, I'd like to uh, tell you about the Palmdale situation. They, they have passed a, a, a resolution, and, uh, and I, the, the captain as well, we're, we're, we've talked about it ourselves over some time. Uh, we'd like to get something to that effect passed by here. If, and I understand that, that the captain is working on something to that effect now. I, and if you'd like to leave a copy of that resolution, we'd be happy to take a look at that as well. I do have a copy here, if you'd like to have it. That, that would be, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The other speaker card, Mr. David Paul. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a joy to be here, and I first and foremost want to thank everybody for donating this time to pursue uh, these issues. You know. Um, there have been a couple of things lately that I've noticed. Um, last night we talked about our own power, uh, authority, and stuff like that. And all these things are made possible by changes in the law. And it seems like that's where it has to be. It has to be a legislative fix, changes in the law to allow these things to happen. Um, I'm studying this issue uh, closely because of my friend Ed and his passion for it. And, uh, you know, people need to be treated fairly. I'm doing this class on uh, brain chemicals that are secreted, and the more people feel like they belong, the better it is for everybody. Of course, uh, that doesn't always work because the biggest problem is that people don't get out and vote. So um, if you want to have some action, you got to turn out all these people that claim to be passionate and, and to vote. But, but thank you all for your time. Um, it's pretty interesting to come and hear what's said. The eye in the sky, I'll tell you what, I, I like the idea that we have eyes up there to watch stuff. I'm haunted still by the uh, uh, O.J. Simpson riots and that truck driver, Reginald Denny, and the helicopter circling above, and the guy's got that brick in his hand. He goes, bam, and he's just got great joy out of doing that. And that's what happens when the people go crazy. And you can watch it all you want, but uh, unless you have officers on the ground to stop it, uh, there's nothing that's going to stop it. So it, it's, it's, it's a resource. It's an added bonus. I think about those uh, Google copters that are going to deliver your package, and along the way they can take some pictures and send in some info. That's the future that's coming. But um, in the meantime, if there was something we could get a like a silencer on the plane, I'd appreciate that. Because when it circles over your house eight, nine times, you know, it's just droning, droning. And by the third time, you're going, hope they catch that guy. So um, that's my thoughts. And again, just thank you all. Thank you all for everything you do. It's, it's a pleasure to come and be part of this all. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, consent calendar, but again, we do not have a quorum, so if we can just bring that back at the next meeting, Brent, that would be wonderful. Continued business, item one, discussion uh, regarding vehicle impound policies. Again, this will be discussion. Um, as Mr. Fuller had mentioned, there was a subcommittee that had been formed prior. I believe that included Mr. Fuller, Dr. Brown, and Sheree Pickens. So if you'd like to share your discussions. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Galindo gave us sort of a preamble, and it's uh, it's taken us some time due to delays with election, et cetera, and also to gather more information. But we did meet um, last time uh, about a week and a half ago, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. DeRico. Uh, in attendance, uh, Mark Brown, Sheree Pickens, myself, and then on the side of the city, Lee Rico, and uh, Tracy Stewart. And we looked at uh, several things. One, being the state law uh, concerning impoundments, as it's written um, at this time, uh, the policy that provides the Sheriff Department with discretion for impoundments. And then we also looked at actual impoundment data. One of the uh, concerns was that there was perhaps um, certain sections, segments of society that were being targeted or unduly affected by um, the enforcement of this law um, and by the impoundings themselves. We also looked at the new law, AB 60, that's being implemented in 2014 uh, to allow undocumented immigrants to obtain California driver's licenses and what impact that would have, what changes that would make. And then we also looked at a Los Angeles um, city ordinance allowing for expedited release of impound vehicles. So that framed the discussion that we had um, during this latest meeting. And we came up with some findings that we wanted to present um, to the commission and a specific recommendation. Um, we found that there actually does exist flexibility for the sheriff's department to use discretion before they impound a vehicle. And we saw evidence of that discretion being used through the data that was collected based on uh, different traffic stops that had been made um, and more specifically, the, uh, what is it for alcohol stops? Well, there's a name for that, fancy name for that, but uh, we're, they're looking for impaired drivers. Um, we did not find any evidence that one segment of society was being unfairly targeted for vehicle uh, impoundments. In fact, it was pretty spread across the, the spectrum, and the reasons were varied. Uh, it wasn't because uh, necessarily people were unlicensed. There were a lot of other issues that came um, into play. Uh, we also talked about what happens after the vehicles are impounded, and state law is pretty clear. It dictates what's required to obtain release of the vehicle after it's been impounded. So although there's discretion on behalf of the sheriffs, our understanding in terms of doing the impounding itself, much less flexibility when it comes to the release of those vehicles. So we talked about the modifying the release procedures of impounded vehicles, and that that would require, in some cases, violation of state law, but certainly expose the sheriff's department and perhaps the city um, to increased liability, especially if a released vehicle is involved in a secondary fence, such as a traffic accident. Uh, you've impounded a vehicle. Um, you've made an exception to what state law dictates. That person gets their vehicle, and then they're involved in an accident and the city or the sheriff's department um, has made a decision that basically allowed that to happen. That provides a, a liability we believe uh, should definitely be taken into consideration in anything that the city does. State law has been modified. It's not in effect. It'll happen in this next year really to address the issue specifically, which is to provide driver's license to individuals who are not in the country legally. So it will resolve the issue in many ways uh, beginning on uh, January 1st, if I'm not mistaken. And from what I've read, this is outside of our subcommittee, uh, but read in the paper, is that there's a lot of work that's going into that now um, because uh, there is a lot of work that's required before all the bugs are worked out of a new system. People have to be trained. Licenses need to be obtained. Um, and those are, are being dealt with with the state, and it, it may not be... Uh, feasibly, uh, fiscally possible for the city to take on that effort between now and January since that work is being done by the state of California. We looked at that LA County City Ordinance uh, that allowed for expedited release of impounded vehicles. Uh, we understand that it's been challenged and it's either in litigation or overturned. Um, the city city council of uh, Los Angeles. It's been cha it's been challenged. Been challenged. Okay, so even if we were to make a recommendation along those those lines, there are there's pending litigation against that um, ordinance that was given to us as an example of perhaps a model for the city of Lancaster. Um, as a subcommittee, we do believe that a driver's license does represent a minimum requirement to assure the public that a driver understands the vehicle code and has the minimum skills required to safely operate a vehicle. Um, without that minimum requirement being, made, being met, we would be reluctant to suggest uh, that an individual will be allowed to drive or to be able to operate a vehicle in the state of California, or certainly in our case in the city of Lancaster. 
So we don't condone providing special treatment to individuals who do not have that required license. Is the same that we would not um, condone having a general contractor being able to construct homes without a license or a dentist to pull teeth without their proper license. It provides a certain assurance to the public that someone has met a minimum requirement that's required. Not that they're necessarily skilled. I know from my own kids when they got their licenses, it did not mean that they were ready. But as far as the state was concerned, they met the, the minimal requirements. And we also cannot recommend that the city take on the liability of not following state law in relation to vehicle impoundments. So we have a specific recommendation to the Criminal Justice Commission uh, from the subcommittee, which can be considered when we have a quorum. And it is as follows. Uh, subcommittee tasked with examining the vehicle impoundment policy of the city of Lancaster does not recommend the Sheriff Department or the city of Lancaster make any exceptions to existing policy that violates state law or discriminates either for or against any subset of society. So with that, uh, we have concerns um, and some recommendations that uh, we tread lightly, and that uh, would, be, would have been the formal recommendation to this commission going forward uh, to hopefully allow the city council to make a more informed uh, decision when they choose to do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Um, appreciate the time that Lee and staff has put together as well as the subcommittee. You've done your research and provided a lot of information to uh, consider when we do have a quorum. Um, any further comments from any of the commissioners? No? Okay. And again, this will continue at our next meeting, which I believe is June 10th, um, and hopefully we'll have a quorum at that time. So, 11th. 11th, I'm sorry. Commission staff presentations, updates, reports, monthly crime stats. Mr. Cobalt. Thank you, Chairman Vera. Uh, this measurement period looks at April 6th to May the 3rd, 2014. Uh, these are the numbers, and they'll be available, or they are already available on the web uh, if anybody wants to look at them in detail. Synopsis of it is that. Uh, uh, when we compare the May 2014 report to the March uh, 2014 report for May of 2014, in this report the data represented a weekly average of 26.25 Part 1 crimes with a median of 77.5. That's as opposed to what we saw back in the March report, which was 65 for an average and a median of 64.5. Now, this is our our month to month comparison for the last two years. Um, one of the things that I draw your attention to down here at the bottom, I always place every every month when we do a presentation what the previous twelve months have told us in terms of of what our um, what our crime rate is. And just as a refresher, crime rate is your free or is your frequency that's divided by your population. Now our population went down just a little, or our population rather went up just a little bit with the release of information from uh, the Department of Finance. We picked up about 1,200 citizens according to their estimates, which which helps us out in our crime rate. Uh, the thing that's interesting with regard to this is is the the estimate that's given us by the Department of Finance and of course they they admitted in 2010 that their their population estimates for the uh, for the decade were pretty much off they estimate uh, 159,878 people for the city of Lancaster the city of Lancaster also purchases the demographic package from uh, Nielsen Claritas Nielsen Claritas in last year's um, estimate for uh, 2013 estimated our population at 166,000 and uh, change. And the reason why that's important is when you start calculating the crime rate, uh, we're showing up here a crime rate right now of 267. However, if we maybe got a little more accurate estimate of our population, if we take Nielsen Claritas's numbers, we're at 257.16, which is basically about a 10-point difference. So population is really important to this thing, and getting an accurate 
estimate really uh, helps us, and it really doesn't cost us anything. We don't have to hire a deputy for it. We don't have to do anything else. So when I, when I put this up here, it's important to understand that simply by looking at our population estimates, we can have a pretty big impact on our crime rate. When we take a look at the most active reporting districts for Part 1 crimes, uh, we can see that 1135, 1132, 1126, 37, and 27 all uh, popped high again. When we take a look at where those events happened, you can see that the density again follows the area that's around Avenue J. Uh, for 1135, Avenue J from a, basically between Challenger and 20th Street East. Again, if you remember at the last, at the last um, uh, presentation, I put up a map that showed basically there are four primary areas where, where we, where we uh, score the highest from month to month. And again, that, that holds true for this time. It's the 10th Street, e, or 10th Street West and Avenue K, Valley Central Way between uh, uh, between Lancaster Boulevard and Avenue J, uh, the Land Lancaster Boulevard area, and the 20th Street East and uh, Avenue J area. And of course, we can see that here, and then we'll see the mirror, the southern mirror of this on the, on the south end when we get to 1137. This is 1132, and the prior, one of the highest areas of density is up here in the area from, uh, uh, or in the housing area from roughly about 5th Street East over to Challenger Way from Avenue I down to Kettering. You can see the density there. Uh, everything else is pretty much spread out. Eleven twenty-six. A lot of our issues pretty much center along the the area from uh, Avenue K from 10th Street West to 20th Street West, and and in that general vicinity. And of course, this is the mirror image to the south, eleven thirty-seven from eleven thirty-five, and again we see the area right up here along uh, uh, Avenue J and just within a few blocks of Avenue J to the south for our highest densities. And then 11, or in 1127, uh, again, Valley Central Way from, uh, um, from Lancaster Boulevard down to uh, uh, Avenue J. When we look at residential burglaries, uh, we can see the frequency distribution here from 1132 with 13 to 1135 with 6, 1137 with 6, and 1126 with 5. Larcenies involving vehicles, 1126 was 7, 1192 was 6, 1122, 32, and 37 with 5 each. Our trends, we, what's interesting and what's good is when we take a look at uh, trends, uh, we can see that assault is going up. Uh, then we move from crimes going up to what's trending flat. That would include homicide, arson, or, excuse me, um, and arson trending flat. Then we have uh, rape trending down pretty strongly. We have robbery uh, trending down over a 52-week period. We have burglary trending down, and we have larceny trending down and grand theft auto. This is the distribution of the uh, Part One crimes over the uh, over the last uh, or over this measurement period, and this is the spatial trend analysis that shows us exactly where in the city it went up and where it went down. Uh, as we take a look at the uh, calls for service, uh, the new entry on here is. Uh, uh, or one of the primary new entries on here was a uh, 1717 East Avenue I, Blue Skies Mobile Home Park. Uh, that was also a density in 1135 uh, that came up. The majority of their uh, of these calls for services were, were for uh, Part 1 crimes. And of course this is the way that it lays out across the city. This is our forecast for uh, May of 2014. 
we're forecasting 356 Part 1 crimes uh, for April. We forecasted 356. There were actually 352. So we had an accuracy rate of 99%. Questions? Questions? Comments? Thank you very much. We'll move on to the arrest stats. Uh, LA County Sheriff's Department, Deputy Ruiz. Uh, good morning again. Uh, our arrest stats are consistent of the months of March and April. I know we were gone last month, so I have uh, a report for both of those months. Uh, the burglary suppression team, they were, uh, for the month of March, for felony arrests, they had 30 felony arrests and had 26 in April. So pretty consistent there, not a little bit of a drop off. Uh, parolees arrested of those felony arrests, uh, zero in March and one in April. Um, search warrants, um, they had two in March and then three in April. So everything seems to be pretty consistent. Uh, the real uh, jump was in the Ramey warrants, where in March they had six and uh, 12 in April. So that about doubled. And that was pretty much consistent with the amount of recovered stolen property also after identifying these suspects. Um, $7,000 of property was recovered in March and three times that with 21000 in the month of April. Firearms recovered uh, pretty low uh, in comparison to some of the other months that they've had before. So um, uh, that's it for the burglary suppression team. The land cap team also had some pretty good consistencies there from month to month. April um, and March in comparison, there was a jump as far as felony arrests, as you can see, to 70. Misdemeanor arrest, uh, slight rise with, uh, with three. Firearms recovered, um, that was related to uh, a major uh, a search warrant that they did and recovered, uh, recovered three in one search warrant and then two more off the streets. So they're fairly active as far as recovering firearms that month. Parolees arrested actually dropped in comparison from the month of March. Uh, the percentage of that 59 was 12, or I'm sorry, less than 12. Uh, there was 10% of parolees arrested in the month of April for the number of uh, felony arrests that they had. So they had seven parolees arrested. Uh, the illegal narcotics activity that was uh, seized was $21,000, almost $22,000 in the month of March, and then a little over $17,000 in the month of April. So pr pretty consistent from month to month. And then our narcotics team. Felony arrest, for, you can see in the month of March they had 11, they dropped down to six. Um, however, there was an increase as far as methamphetamine that was confiscated from uh, 420 grams to 784 grams, so that almost doubled. Marijuana dropped um, from 60 grams to only 3 grams. However, March, uh, they had a huge activity as far as search warrants with 6. They dropped down to, I'm sorry, with 8 in March, and then in April they had 6. Um, very productive as far as firearms recovery for the month of April compared to March, where they didn't have any. And then uh, during the month of March, uh, we have an annual event, which is uh, very active at our station. We're happy to congratulate our uh, Lancaster Station Baker to Vegas team. Um, the year before, in 2013, that was, that was the first year that we had our own team separate from Palmdale Station, and we placed third. And of the 12 years that I've been running in at Lancaster Station, that's the highest we ever ran. This past year in March, we actually did even better than that and came in first place in our category. So we're extremely proud of all the efforts of our 20 runners, uh, four support runners, which put us at 24 runners total, and our 30-plus support staff who were able to take the time to go in Las Vegas, stay competitive, uh, which benefits the community, obviously, because it, it, it creates a, not only a camaraderie environment at the station where we're happy to come to work and stay productive, but also a health benefit. I mean, which we're still continuing during this time because we have a memorial event run this weekend and other runs throughout the year to keep that competitive edge, to have us that focus on that goal of uh, not only competitive, competitive running but health um, and welfare behind that. So I'm very proud of them. You can see that's uh, Lieutenant Kent Crager at the finish line. Uh, he's pretty much gassed out. He's done. Uh, that was actually his anniversary weekend, so uh, he was able to uh, come on out. Uh, his wife let us come play with us for uh, about 30 minutes of his run time. And uh, again, we're very proud of all that. Just to comment on that, just Pat and I actually used to run on that too, if you could believe it. 
long time ago. Pat, lots, not that long ago. Me, long time ago. What decade? I'm not sure I'd call that running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hobbling. So. Wheelbarrow races. <laughs> so are you able to bring home a trophy for your trophy case in the... Absolutely, sir. Well, yeah, it's up good. there on the wall. Yeah, Very first good. place trophy. And, and I can't, I'd be remiss if I were to also give credit to a, a lot of our community members that helped us uh, financial support from our AV Sheriff's Boosters to um, uh, Annual Valley Chevrolet, um, Hunter Dodge. Uh, we've helped, helped us out before in the past also, uh, along with um, um, Texas Cattle Company, our ALADS uh, union, along with... Uh, First City Credit Union also. They've been very helpful with uh, making sure that a lot of the incidentals were taken care of for us. Granted, it's still out of pocket for all of us, and we're all willing to go out to Las Vegas. Who's not? You know, I don't know, but, you know, fuel costs and other things that go with that. Very helpful with that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, congrats. Yes, sir. Can you uh, tell the commission in regards to the Fallen Heroes event that's happening at the station and invite the criminal justice if they'd like to attend. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, at 11 o'clock on Thursday, the 22nd, we're going to have our, uh, you're referring to our barbecue that we have at the station. Um, we have a memorial fountain up there which has the names of the seven uh, uh, deputies from Lancaster Station and what used to be AV Station up on the wall there. And it's an opportunity for us to take time and not only um, uh, memorialize them, but we also just nationwide also, um, all the other law enforcement officers that were killed in line of duty and uh, benefit from the AV Sheriff's Boosters um, to help with our barbecue. So it, not only does it create camaraderie, just awareness of the fact that, you know, we're honoring our fallen heroes, as also today, you know, is a burial for LAPD officer Robert Sanchez, which we also mourn that loss. But... Um, We'll have a gathering there, a barbecue event um, in the back of the station parking lot. So you're more than welcome to come. It's going to be from 11, generally, until about 1 o'clock. Get there quick. The food will go fast. <laughs> but we'll have plenty to go around. Thank you, Thank you for the invite. You're welcome. Thank you. California Highway Patrol update. Do we have a representative from the Highway Patrol today? No? Then we'll move on to District Attorney update. Mr. Franklin. Thank you. <clears throat> for, the, uh, for the month of April, um, Again, this is the Antelope Valley, so this includes Lancaster and Palmdale, not just uh, Lancaster. But we had uh, 334 felony complaints issued, and to uh, put that into perspective, that's fewer than what San Fernando uh, had filed, fewer than what uh, um, the airport court, what we call LAX uh, airport court, has filed. And it's on par with... Uh, with Van Eyes, so I think that does uh, concurs with the statistics we heard uh, earlier about some of the violent crimes uh, actually going down a bit. In um, for misdemeanors, um, we filed 699 in the uh, month of April, and that is uh, the most in in the county. Compton is second with 600 and. Uh, 51. April was a busy month for jury trials for us. We had 17, which is substantially more than uh, uh, what other uh, other branches uh, did, and uh, that's because, especially on the serious and violent uh, cases, we don't, uh, you know, we we expect an appropriate sentence, and we're not going to give in just to move cases along. That we don't play that game. So there were um, several murder cases tried, um, child molestation cases, residential burglary, assault with, with deadly weapon, kidnap for robbery, and we had some very, very serious cases, and we were very successful on, uh, on these matters. And then finally, um, a, um, a long-term uh, employee who uh, I consider a friend, uh, his name's Ronald Smallstick. He was doing uh, his second tour here in the uh, Antelope Valley with the district attorney's office. Um, he was filing this tour, last tour, he was trying a lot of significant cases uh, 
death penalty type cases, but uh, he unexpectedly passed away last week. And so anybody who knew uh, Mr. Smallstig, uh, please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. His memorial service is uh, 22 May at 1100 hours, and it's at uh, Christ Lutheran Church, at, uh, uh, which is on Tournament Road in uh, Valencia. And um, so that, that really put a uh, downward spiral for the, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the troops. He was very well liked. Uh, and that that concludes my briefing. I would like to uh, commend your office on not taking the easy way out and going to trial and, and getting the uh, just punishment. It's nice Thank to you, know Commissioner. that we live in an area like that. Thank you. Thank you, and sorry for the loss of your colleague. Thank you. Uh, from Business Watch Subcommittee, Public Safety Update, Mr. Drico. Yes, sir. Uh, just to comment, Mr. Smallstig was also a part of Mr. Cooley's office when Mr. Cooley was here originally back when he was the head deputy DA in Mr. Franklin's place back many, many years ago. So Ron has a long history here. A really super good guy. Um, it's, a, it's a shame because there's been a, a history of things in his family that have been devastating the last few years. So, But a very, very loyal person to this community. Yes. Um, okay. On uh, as we move forward with our business watch, um, we work very closely, uh, public safety staff has, with our Clean and Safe Committee down here from the Boulevard Association. So that's been a priority. Uh, we've been out doing um, uh, SEPTED inspections of locations for crime prevention, lighting. Those things are being addressed in these meetings, and, uh, and they've just performed that uh, last week on a couple of evenings out with that group and walk the boulevard and, and the downtown area. So we'll be working in that direction. That's our concentration point for this month. Um, so far, we've identified some things that Jim's been doing some statistical gathering data as it relates to uh, the other places we've been comparably to places we haven't been with the big program. The things that are coming out of that is it seems there's a trend to where we have a certain presence of private security at locations seems to help us statistically as it relates to uh, loss prevention and those things in those areas too and parking lot incidents. So we're going to emphasize that as we move forward. Um, we had a lot of activity in the last couple months. Uh, we, uh, our public safety staff as well as the park staff and, and other resources here from the city were hugely assisted at the L.A. County Air Show and some issues they had there, thanks to Dr. Vieira showing up with about 200 ROTC kids for the parking lot to work with our staff and our security plan. And I can say that we actually went through uh, attendance of probably 100, well over 100,000 people in two days and didn't have any incident as far as anything related to, to uh, a law enforcement or issue that way. Um, there, we had a huge presence there from the Sheriff's Department as far as the reserve staff, the emergency response crews, and then again the Sheriff Explorers for another couple hundred kids there too as well. So um, they're doing some things for those kids this Saturday to have a barbecue for them. And uh, it, it, the air show was very well received and did, did a lot better than I think they anticipated. Um, we also assisted our park staff and, and with the Poppy Festival, which every year is a big event for us here at the City of Lancaster. This year we incorporated um, a beer garden type setting in for the first time in the history of the, the event. And I have to tell you, the only contact we had that was negative with any one of the beer gardens was someone that already showed up intoxicated and wasn't served. And they, the deputies and the uh, the park rangers handily managed that situation, and that person was removed and taken into custody. But with the number of people that attend that event, that was, you know, that's probably, I can think of probably three times where we've had to intercede with some problem in almost five years that I've been here at the city of all the city events. And I think that's something we should be very proud of based on our planning and, and the presence that, that we maintain at those events for safety and the security of the public to enjoy themselves. Um, we also uh, right now are um, knee deep in working with Mr. Franklin's office on a program that's coming out of the mayor's working group that we have not been able to have that subcommittee meeting yet, but on the first 
First Defense Second Chance program. Uh, Mr. Franklin's office with uh, one of his deputy DAs, Dennis Vincent, have done a significant amount of work as it relates to this diversionary style program. It's something we'll be bringing forward when uh, it, it is done going through the process of his office for approval. Um, it incorporates some players into it along with the Public Defender's Office and the Alternate Public Defender's Office. And with the spirit of it being those individuals that are identified that for specific misdemeanor crimes who have, never, have no history and truly is determined by the evaluation of the detectives investigating that case and the DA's office to be someone that's worthy of an opportunity to, to divert that case out of the, the system. Um, so we've it's been a lot of hard work. They've put a ton of hours into that. We've had a ton of meetings behind it. And I think, you know, we're at a point now where we're almost there and a time to present, bring forward to the commission. Um, something we're also working on is uh, some issues as it relates to homelessness down in our area here, working closely with our uh, homeless Coalition and Mr. Baker from Grace Resource, identifying the difference between our local homeless population that has a historical tie to our community and our transitory homeless population. So you're, we're going to be, uh, the deputies did an operation last week that trying to working closely with Metrolink to try and make a determination if that's an avenue for uh, the transitory population. Uh, we're going to be going out in the next couple of weeks and doing surveys of the homeless population out here to try and figure out historically if they have a tie to this community and where they came from. Just so there's some services out there and there's some actually funding that may be available to help us in that endeavor. Um, also, um, I've been working closely with the city attorney on how we um, we are evaluating our chronic nuisance ordinance, how we apply it, and then really trying to move that direction into the public safety office with us managing that more based on repeated calls for service and identified nuisance calls for the sheriff's deputies because it becomes a resource management issue. Okay, it's just some of some of these locations and we're not, you know, you can't look at the hospital or some of them because those are, you know, the deputies have to respond there based on the calls there and the station as well. But for other ones out there that pose a significant resource drain continually for issues that are, you know, problematic, we want to address those appropriately and make that more uniform and and throughout the community. So that's the direction we're going right now, so that's the emphasis. And then um, I'm working closely now. We're very finally, very, probation is very close to having an active day reporting center for AB 109 releases. I know we saw in the governor a couple weeks ago praise the glowing success of that program, and I imagine that any of us could probably bring a number of issues forward that clearly disputes that. Okay, I would like to, with your permission at the next meeting, bring forward some um, more more information as it relates to current numbers of releases and, and then the actual discussion with probation. There's a desire by probation to come forward and talk to the commission again. So um, I'll probably post some information out to you that they provided to me. So we're prepared to have that discussion with them with your permission. And then if we could have the representatives from the Sheriff's Department as well provide the numbers they've had for um, what, what arrests. And, and then there's the clear discussion for me always seems to be, and I think what we focus on, what do they consider recidivism in their program? By the information that was released from the governor's office, there is like no recidivism. But I will tell you that the number of arrests and cases filed by Mr. Franklin are significantly will tell you that is not the case. So I think it, it's worthy of having a discussion in, the, in this forum about it. Yeah, look forward to hearing that. All right, sir. And that's everything. Okay. Yep. Public business from the floor, non agendized. We have no speaker cards to that effect. So comments from commissioners? Any comments? Just, just one brief comment. I know, Lee, you, you touched on the events that take place in the city of Lancaster, and then another, another kudo to the city of Lancaster. We have the Poppy Festival, the air show, and then just past week, and we had the uh, Lieutenant Dan Band over at the Jeddock Stadium, which I think was just an outstanding uh, event where Gary Sinise and his folks came in and put on a, just an excellent, outstanding performance. And, of course, those pre proceeds went to uh, bringing Gerald Hancock all the way home with his, his house. So good event. Uh, I thought that uh, it was just handled perfectly by the city and all that was there. And, and there were no, no downsides to anything that I saw, at least in, 
at the time I was there. And also along with that, the tremendous effort the students from Lancaster High School put into that process. Very nice. And with that, we'll adjourn uh, at approximately 11 o'clock and reconvene on Wednesday the, the 11th of June at 10 a.m. Thank you.